If there's one thing that homeowners, builders, and design professionals can agree on, it's that we don't want to build a leaky roof. It's in everyone's best interest to ensure that the roof remains watertight and durable, because if we have a roof leak, it's going to end up in the rest of the building very quickly, ruining all of the interior finishes and supporting mold growth and rot. In this video, we're talking about three critical flashing details that you need to get right to prevent leaks and future damage to your home or building. Let's get into it. The first detail that we need to get right is at our fascia or roof edge, more specifically at our drip edge or gutter apron. A drip edge is a vaguely L-shaped piece of metal flashing with a crimped edge that gets mechanically attached to the edge of the roof sheathing and extends down over the fascia and gutter system. Now the point of this flashing is to break surface tension and to kick water away and prevent it from draining back towards the roof and the fascia board. If we don't have this piece of flashing, surface tension pulls water back towards the building and away from the gutter, and sometimes on more shallow roofs roofs, it can pull water back underneath the shingles, getting underneath the framing, and causing all kinds of issues. If you look at any old buildings that have been around for a long time, more specifically older masonry buildings, they were meticulously detailed at cornices and ledges with lead and copper flashings with drip edges to kick water away from the masonry in order to avoid concentrations of bulk water. We sort of imported that technology and applied it to roof systems at edges to kick water away from our moisture sensitive framing. Now when it comes to installing drip edges, there are a few things that we need to get right. Perhaps one of the biggest issues that I see is that the drip edge is installed over the primary roofing underlayment, not underneath the underlayment. If water was to run over the underlayment, it's not going to drain over the drip edge. It'll drain underneath and behind it, defeating the point of the drip edge. The first thing is that we want to apply a strip of peel and stick membrane, like an ice and water shield product, onto the surface of the sheathing and at the roof edge and down over the subfascia prior to installing the drip edge, the fascia board, or the primary roof underlayment. What this does is that it protects the eaves from water damage if water happens to leak behind the drip edge for whatever reason, and believe me it happens. Then we can install our fascia board over the flashed subfascia along with our drip edge flashing. Now when we install our drip edge, we actually don't want it to be installed flush with the fascia. We want to make sure that it's set forward slightly to prevent water from being pulled back towards the fascia board instead of being kicked away. Remember, this is surface tension that we're trying to manage, and so we want to break that surface tension by spacing the drip edge away by about a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch. Sometimes you'll see shim being installed behind the drip edge to provide a spacer between those two surfaces. Then after the drip edge has been installed, we're free to install the underlayment so that it laps over the drip edge, and this can be your preferred roofing underlayment, whether it's a traditional roofing paper or felt, synthetic underlayment, or a peel and stick membrane for superior water resistance, which is what I personally recommend for nearly every roof assembly. Finally, you can install your shingles or whatever roof covering that you've selected over that. The next details that you need to get right are your step flashing and kick out flashing details. These are basic standards of care and construction, but they're so often neglected or poorly installed in retrofit applications and additions, as well as even in some shoddy new construction, and it's these flashing details that we tend to see the most issues with. If you're unaware what step flashings and kickout flashings are, we're talking about the flashings that we apply at roof to wall or roof to sidewall transitions. Basically, the point of these flashings is to prevent water from finding a path between that seam. Kickout flashings are the termination of a step flashing at the gutter transition, and basically the kickout flashing quite literally kicks water away from the intersecting wall and directs it to the gutter. And these can be composed of metal or formed plastic, but you need to have this in order to prevent water from draining against your wall assembly. Some of the worst moisture failures that I've observed have occurred at these transitions. Step flashings are an L-shaped metal flashing that should be staggered with your shingles and overlapped in a way that allows for water to be directed away from the adjacent sidewall. Water that runs down the roof will first hit the top course of shingles, drain down onto a piece of step flashing, which is lapped over the next course of shingles, and so on and so forth. Any water that happens to find a path underneath the shingles will be managed by the underlayment and hopefully drained out, but this really isn't an issue if you detail this flashing correctly. Then we want to flash the step flashing to the sidewall with some counter flashing that's flashed back to the weather resistive barrier. Now historically this has been done with a piece of metal counter flashing, but nowadays we can actually use a high quality pressure sensitive acrylic tape or a fluid applied flashing product to integrate this step flashing back to the weather resistive barrier. In severe cases we want to do both, but basically this counter flashing will prevent water from draining behind the step flashing if water drains behind the wall. Now when it comes to masonry sidewalls and chimneys, we can't use a flashing tape or a fluid applied flashing, but we actually need to use a metal counter flashing with a regolith. The mortar is partially notched out of the courses 
a brick to retrofit a regulated counter flashing, and the counter flashing is sealed in place with some lead plugs and a compatible elastomeric sealant. And the counter flashing should extend over the step flashing and should have an integrated drip edge to kick water away from the masonry wall or the chimney assembly. The counter flashing also has to be stepped and shingled in a way that prevents water from draining behind the counter flashing regulet. Finally, this last detail is for flat roof terminations, specifically single ply membranes like EPDM, TPO, and PVC, but it's also applicable to some modified bitumen membranes, but this is at roof to wall transitions. Firstly, the roof membrane needs to be installed on a compatible substrate, and we want to make sure that we're using an adhered system so that the membrane is bonded to the roof assembly. We don't want a mechanically fastened system since both water and air can travel freely underneath, and you can get bubbling and blistering. We also want to make sure that we're adhering the membrane to a cover board, not directly to the rigid insulation. This is because the cover board is able to better transfer those thermal stresses down to the roof deck and will provide a much more rigid substrate for the roof membrane, preventing any trapped moisture or gas from causing the roof membrane to bubble. As for transitioning the membrane to the wall assembly, we want to extend the rigid insulation up onto the wall at the level of the roof membrane termination. This is because the roof membrane is highly impermeable and we can't dry through it, and therefore we need to warm the condensing surface of the backside of the sheathing with rigid insulation to prevent condensation from occurring since that wall can only dry inwards. We also want to make sure that the roof membrane terminates at the very least 12 inches above the surface of the roof. Some manufacturers call for more than that, but if you have 12 inches of ponding water on your roof, you have a bigger problem. Now, the roof membrane should terminate at a termination bar, which is a mechanically fastened aluminum or stainless piece of metal that's mechanically fastened to the membrane to prevent the membrane from peeling away from the wall, providing some additional strength, especially when there could be extreme winds acting on the building. The termination bar should be set in a bead of sealant, or a water cutoff mastic should be applied to the top edge, and then we want to add the additional step of flashing that termination bar with a compatible flashing tape or a fluid applied flashing so that we connect the weather resistive barrier at the walls to the roof membrane, preventing any kind of discontinuities in the water controller. Then we can install a piece of metal counter flashing over the termination bar to protect the tapes and sealants from heat and UV damage, and the metal counter flashing will get flashed back to the weather resistive barrier. And there you have a bulletproof flashing system at your flat roof to wall intersections. Guys, we need to take our flashing practices seriously. Take a little extra time and care to execute these details properly, and you'll be sure to save yourself both time and money in the future, as well as your reputation. On this channel, we try to design and build for long-term durability and performance, and we want to future-proof our homes and buildings so that they don't have problems later on. If you found this video helpful, make sure to give it a like, and subscribe for more weekly building science videos, and make sure to head over to siri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics, including all aspects of roofing, waterproofing, retrofitting and insulating existing buildings, basements, and so much more. Links to those will be in the description below. Good luck with your projects. Cheers.